Good afternoon, everyone. I am Noemi Elezam. Uh, I am leading uh, the AI transformation of Societe Generale Group, uh, so the European uh, banking group that you all know operating and uh, different kind of activities uh, in retail banking, CIB banking, and mobility. I'm really, really happy to welcome you for this workshop today. Uh, so we will spend uh, kind of two hours together. Um, and we have divided this workshop in three sections. So um, we will really try to give you a, a 360 uh, view around the way we are considering trustworthy AI in financial services. Uh, we will have one session, let's say, more dedicated to our why. So really, how do we envision uh, trustworthy AI in the FS future? And also, what is the role that we're expecting to play as a major bank in implementing this AI transformation in a responsible way? Uh, the second section will be more dedicated to our what. So what are we really uh, delivering uh, in terms of use cases across the bank? So we'll have the pleasure to present one example on retail banking and one example on wholesale banking. And we'll then have a third section dedicated more to our how, so the way we are driving our, let's say, enterprise-wide AI transformation further than use cases. Um, because we really consider that AI is much more than only a succession of use cases and should uh, drive an over, let's say, a holistic enterprise transformation across uh, financial services. So I will uh, be surrounded with different kind of teams for this workshop. We will have our internal experts from different uh, point of view. You will see very complementary point of views. And uh, we will also be surrounded by some of our partners. As, as you all know, uh, the AI journey is definitely a collective journey uh, where we operate uh, with a couple of partners that we can see here. So um, it's a platitude now to say that uh, AI is much more than a technological um, progress, uh, but is really a change of paradigm in the way we are going to, let's say, revamp our different value chain, being front lines or operational line, risk management. But which is what is less a platitude is that we have to remember that it's, let's say, this AI acceleration is not coming from nowhere. This is really one step further in a whole digital transformation that we have started uh, to implement in financial services maybe 15 to 20 years ago already. And let's say, at least as much as the, the technological progress that we've witnessed uh, during the couple of two years, this is also the level of digital transformation we've managed to reach as an industry that allow us to concretely implement AI now in our business environment. So this is pretty important uh, if we really want to understand, uh, let's say, our journey as a group uh, in terms of AI in Societe Generale. We started to implement it, our first use cases in 2016. Um, at scale on some of them, notably on the most digitalized activities, for example, payment fraud. Um, and we knew a really ac a big acceleration in 2019, basically, uh, where we really started to have a clear target in terms of value generation, our 500 million expected uh, uh, million, 500 euro, million euros expected targeted value coming from our portfolio of uh, AI and advanced analytics. So this is really a journey in the long term, which is now accelerating even more. Why, why is it accelerating even more? I was telling it a bit at the beginning. First, because we have solid digital foundation now. So we have this, let's say, digital interaction being with our customers or internally that are significant enough to generate data and data of quality, to train smarter algorithms, to re-inject in our processes and products in order to have more and more interactions. So 
just two figures maybe. We have six million customers in Boursobank, which is one example, but also in retail, we have now more than 70% of our customers across geography, which are primary digital. So just give you a sense of the level of digitization that we have, where we can build on in order to, uh, to implement a, a real AI transformation. We also gathered an internal experience, and you will have the pleasure to listen for the, from the teams to really share what we've learned on the field by delivering AI use cases. We can rely also on, a, let's say, a regulatory environment which is becoming more precise. I'm not saying that it's not a constraint, but at least this is, we are gaining in terms of clarity about the rules and how we can play. And of course, the acceleration from a technological point of view, and notably with generative AI, which accelerates a lot and, let's say, increased the potential that we can expect to reach as a bank or a financial services player. This said, if we think a bit about our vision of AI at scale, uh, I would say that it would go much further than use cases if we try to project ourselves. The way we see it is really that AI is going to fuel the different areas of our operation within the bank, but probably with different level of contextualization. If you take the, the low part of the pyramid, in a close future, AI will be the new way to interact with machine, basically. And this does not request a very high level of contextualization specific to your industry. To say it simply, you used to be an expert in using software A, or you used to, let's say, as a customer, use more or less well-designed websites. Tomorrow, you will have a much more standardized and conversational interaction with this kind of interfaces. This does not request a lot of contextualization. Second level, with a bit more context, we will have the possibility to deliver to our customers or our staff a quasi tailor-made suite of assistants or copilot, you can call it as you want, in order to help them in performing the tasks that they want to perform. This requires a bit of context, and you will have an example, and we will talk about a retrieval a bit um, later, and you will have an example of how do you bring the context in this kind of usages. And the top of the, pyra the pyramid is more let's say, an in-depth transformation of some of our core processes that probably will happen more with a combination of different kind of technologies, digital, automation, traditional AI, generative AI, in order to really offer a different experience. Of course, you do not have the same level of complexity on the different stages of the pyramid. It probably will happen in different horizons of time, but this different stages of the pyramid will progress um, simultaneously. This is the reason why AI is becoming much more than before a strategic topic across the financial services and is considered not only by the delivery team, which is essential, but also now is really the matter of all the company and including the top management and the boards and, and we see it also uh, for the people who come in this event for a couple of years that the audience is changing pretty much in this, in this kind of audience. So um, now this is about, let's say, doing the right things. Um, we also have to do things right. We are a bank, so our business model is trust. Our value proposition is responsibility. It's another platitude to talk about the different risks, but there are reality that uh, are still, um, let's say, uh, surrounding AI and more specifically the most recent uh, technologies. Um, it's interesting to just have in mind this uh, representation coming from the OECE of the responsible AI principle that have also been um, used to elaborate the AI Act, and you really see that there is a multiple, let's say, uh, interpretation of what does cover responsible AI. Uh, on some of the aspects, for example, transparency, explicability, respectful of privacy, as banks, we have kind of an experience. 
we supervise models for a couple of years already. I do not say that everything is easy. We will have to adapt. There are some changes to be made. The research is still progressing as well, notably on explicability and with some interesting news, by the way, yesterday. But let's say we, we have kind of an experience. There are other topics where, which are more emerging and as well very linked to the Mm, that is the magnitude of the AI transformation uh, that uh, we are at the beginning of. And for example, there is our role as a banker in terms of AI sovereignty, uh, our willingness as a responsible banker to do AI for positive impact, and uh, our, let's say, um, also commitment as responsible employer to read the human-centered AI principle from the point of view of our people, our staff, in order to think about what has to be done in terms of strategic workforce planning. On these three topics where we are less, let's say, advanced collectively, I will have the pleasure to welcome my three first panelists. Uh, so I will welcome Audrey Franc, so he's coming, uh, our senior banker from Société Générale in charge of covering the French tech ecosystem. Welcome, Audrey. Hi, everyone. Very happy to be here. I have the pleasure as well to welcome Chloe Claire. So Chloe is the CEO of Neymar. I will help let her the pleasure to present Neymar in detail. Thank you, Chloe. Welcome. Hello, everybody. And Leticia Kaito. Leticia Kaito is one of our partners as she's leading the responsible AI practice uh, in Accenture. And uh, she will uh, share some very interesting views on what they've done in terms of uh, uh, work strategic workforce planning. <laughs> so I will change. Can you hear me? So I'm very happy to have you, ladies. Uh, to start uh, this round table around, let's say, this different aspect of responsible AI. So uh, I will start with Audrey. I will have start with you, Audrey. So you are the senior banker uh, specialized in the coverage of the French tech uh, clients and ecosystem in Société Générale. Uh, so I would like to ask you this question. What is your, let's say, your reading of the AI ecosystem in France today? And what link do you make with the, response, with the sov sovereignty in terms of AI and our role as a banker? Um, thank you, Noemi. Um, yeah, as, as bankers um, at Société Générale, we have a beautiful observation seat on the AI revolution, actually. Because we see companies. We see companies every day. We see small ones. We see bigger ones. We have our retail uh, banking activities. We have the investment banking activities. So we have the capacity to see uh, these companies evolving at very high speed on that topic, on that AI topic. Um, this is not new, actually, but it's taken on an extra dimension recently, and it's clearly visible. Um, so we have traditional companies transforming themselves, and we have AI creating space, allowing space for new businesses, startups, actually. Um, so this is our observation right now. More than 50% of our clients already use AI, or are currently in the process of deploying it. OK, so they prepare. Uh, credit rational. Credit rational around AI is booming. So this is actually really a concern. Um, yeah, so AI is everywhere. It's a fact. And it's pretty obvious, actually, why it's everywhere for companies. Uh, you said it already, uh, Noemi. Um, there are multiple ways for companies to derive value from AI. Um, the, the, the computing power delivered by AI makes it possible to do a lot of things. You can reduce risk errors. You can execute multiple testing, testing of codes, for example. Um, you can uh, enhance productivity, as simple as that. So yeah, what we see as bankers is very deep, a very vibrant, can I say that? Vibrant ecosystem, very diverse ecosystem around AI. Um, with, a lot of, uh, with a lot of companies thinking about it, traditional and new ones, and startups. Now, uh, coming back to your question about sovereignty. 
Um, my point is this. Sovereignty is not self-sufficiency. We all know that. Okay, so it's not about mastering the whole value chain on AI from chips to assembling, hosting, LLMs, um, sophisticated applications. Uh, no one can do that. France cannot do that. Europe cannot do that. No one can do that. But if you master one link, if you're super efficient at one stage or some stages of the process, then you become unavoidable. And then you get your bargaining power. So your question about sovereignty, bottom line is a question about performance and our capacity to grow champions. So can we grow AI champions in France? My answer to that is yes, actually, definitely. Uh, we may be good runners on that, uh, maybe front runners, because we have one thing that is a game changer, we have the French tech ecosystem. Uh, so we have a, um, a very strong ecosystem driven by innov innovation, and which is already here, which is already there, which is supported by uh, significant public measures with a real concern to create a research community a true um, uh, concern to attract talent, to develop them. So yeah, I think we have a positive advantage on that. And our responsibility as bankers, of course, is to empower as much as we can those companies. So this is, of course, the, the expected question. How do we, let's say, support as a French bank, major French bank, and with European and international capabilities as well? How do we support yeah. this ecosystem as a banker? Yeah, um, we have... We have a corporate franchise at Sogen, and we have a French tech franchise at Sogen. So there's a real appetite for innovative companies with high potential. And in my opinion, AI companies showing that they have ambition and showing the way are good candidates for us. So what we do, what we do simply is we bring the best expertise that we have in the bank down to them from very basic banking services, day-to-day -day services, cash in cash out, uh, opening account, um, to very sophisticated advisory, m and IPOs, who have this bunched in um, joint venture that we've just signed, increasing our capacities on the equity capital market um, around the globe. Um, we have created a dedicated business center for startups and AI startups right in the middle of Paris. Uh, we have bankers in France, everywhere in France actually, to um, discuss with them and, and to try and serve them. Um, we address, of course, international expansion and trade. And we have this, also this strategic dialogue with funds and sponsors that we bank, by the way. So uh, we are right in the middle. I think we're in the game. Happy to discuss with them. Uh, we finance, very important. We're able to put credit on the table, even if the profile is a bit negative. We just need to, you know, draw uh, the context and think about it. Um, maybe one thing um, uh, quite specific about AI is that today everybody talks about AI. As a banker, I'm very happy when I see AI in a business plan. I mean, that's a thing, but it's not everything. It's not everything. Not everything is saved because of AI. So we have to dig to go down very deep into the models to understand, and sometimes it's quite difficult with AI, um, to see what's at stake, actually. Uh, so how do you monetize? How you do, you, you, if there is a shift, what is your shift thanks to AI? What is your product shift? Um, what is your path to profitability? So the question that we always ask as bankers, but I mean, our job also is to dig very deep, very down into AI to, to understand. Uh, I mean, it's sometimes it's quite difficult for us, but um, yeah, it's we're, we're very happy to do that with entrepreneurs because we learn from them also. So, AI entrepreneurs, any of them right in the room today, please come and discuss. We're happy. Thank you very much, Audrey. Um, so you you gave the point of view, let's say, of the responsible banker. Uh, now, I would like to cover with Chloe uh, another aspect, which is, uh, let's say, Chloe, you're, you're a CEO of Neymar. Neymar is both an AI company and a green tech. Uh, when we know that ESG and, and AI sometimes, let's say, are pushed by kind of contrary winds. So how do you reconcile the two concepts in the Neymar value proposition? 
Um, as we discuss about AI, uh, as you know, uh, AI can uh, make a lot of things. So of course, it can also contribute to the uh, uh, to having an impact and a positive impact on this planet. Just to uh, uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, explanation, what we do at Neymar is to produce uh, to use uh, the big data capacities to be able to describe every building of a territory. And we do use AI algorithm to be able to say for such building, what is the best solution in, in terms of uh, ecological transition, in terms of decarbonation with energy retrofitting or uh, so, uh, solar uh, installations, and in, 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 um, and, in, 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 and for adaptation, being able to say to adapt to the future climate, because buildings have been designed for the past climate, to adapt to the future climate, that is the best solution. And we use that uh, to, uh, we use those data so as to uh, characterize portfolios of insurers and bankers so that they can talk to their client about these things. And we also do uh, B2B2C simulators again for uh, uh, public authorities, insurance and banks, so that it can touch as many people as possible. What we do is not just data or AI for the pleasure of it, it's to make a decision tool for every of you here who can put its address into our simulator and know what is the best solution. Because thanks to AI, we've been able to recognize trees, we've been able to recognize buildings, to recognize many things, and to cross various data. So what I, I feel good about saying I'm a green tech, tech that uses a lot of AI is uh, the first thing is about uh, my carbon footprint, of course. Uh, so what we, do, what we did is to compare the carbon footprint of the cloud that we're using for our uh, AI algorithm, which is about 20 tons, which is about 1.5 French person, or, or two, two French, no, uh, two French person, I was thinking American, and, uh, and the impact that our solutions can have. And what I know is that uh, some of our clients tell us that uh, half of the um, uh, credit loan they give for energy retrofitting is thanks to our simulator. So when you do an energy retrofitting of a house, you're saving about five tons of CO2. So you see, I've already, of course, I, I have to, but I've already uh, um, been much further than the impact of my tech compared to the impact of giving a tool to people. And that's just one example. There are many other green techs. Uh, to give a tool to the people to make the right decision for them and for the planet. So I feel good about, I feel good about being a green tech using AI. Thank you, Chloe. And you're right to feel good, I guess. Can you uh, elaborate maybe just a bit on uh, our partnership and the, the product that we're uh, building and selling together to our customers? Yes. So we, uh, we work uh, with Société Générale with various teams because data can, uh, can help uh, various teams. So we work with the risk teams, for example, uh, to give them um, the um, energy performance. In France, is a DPE, uh, the energy performance of all the buildings they have in their, credit in their home loans, uh, credit loans. Uh, some of them have never, di di have never done uh, such, uh, such a test because they have not sold their house, they're not renting their house. And by giving this information that doesn't exist um, to the teams of risk, they are able to first do some reporting of what is the current uh, situation as of today to make strategies with the ESG team saying, OK, our portfolio is made like that. This is the distribution. Where, want, where do we want to be in the future? And then they can uh, give the information to all the agencies, the councillors, on who in their portfolio they should talk about energy retrofitting. And we do the same with the, um, uh, for solar, uh, solar retrofitting. You've maybe heard of the solar pack uh, from Société Générale. Our data uh, powers the um, tool that the council, uh, councils are using in front of their uh, enterprise uh, clients. So when they talk uh, with them about the feasibility of decarbonation, they use our data 
so that they can simulate in two minutes if there is a potential for their building, the building that they own, the building that they uh, rent, to install solar panels. So each time it's in between making a really complex tech to be able to uh, give the, the solution and the making decision information, and then to make it super simple for all the people to use it. And that is very important. If at the beginning we are doing our data and hoping that people would just extract the intelligence of our data, and that, that's not working because you have to be analytics, you have to be, have special people, etc. So it's all about the use case that you're doing with those data and putting it in the hands of, if possible, as many people so that you have more impact. Thank you very much, Chloe. So we've covered that uh, our role as responsible banker financing the ecosystem. We've covered our role as responsible banker in the transition. We are also a big employer. We have more than 100,000 people employed in the Société Générale Group. So for us, it's very important to, let's say, anticipate the changes that AI is going to bring on jobs. This is not an easy task. This is pretty emerging science, even, I would say. But still, uh, we, we have already some insight and experience. So I will um, ask you my question, Leticia, which is, uh, what do you think is the right, let's say, way, methodology to approach this question, which is pretty sensitive and as well very important as a, an employer? Thank you for the question. I'd like to start with a little uh, analogy. Um, yeah, I would like to, to start with a little analogy, which is the invention of electricity. So you know, when electricity was invented, ultimately it was to replace the candle. And you can see that for, you know, like a number of years after, you know, household appliances were created, you know, light could be coming in a factory. And actually, a lot of people moved from the countryside to the city, and cities were born, yeah? And I think we are at that point in AI where the revolution has started. You know, we started to replace the candle. And we start to see some innovation coming, but we are quite far away from really being able to size uh, the potential of it. So a lot of the innovation on the ground is very organic reinvention at the moment, rather than full reinvention. So we publish uh, in Davos a, a report on the worker and the workforce. I think this is a topic that everybody uh, speak about. I also spoke last year at the uh, OECD um, a forum on the skill shortage. So the methodology we use to start having an idea on how to tackle that product, uh, th that impact, was to use the OSTARnet database, which is describing, on the OECD database, which is describing all the job and the task in the jobs, yeah? And for each of those tasks, we looked at the propensity of AI or generative AI to disrupt them. And then we started to kind of look at all those jobs, how many were going to be potentially uh, having a propensity to be automated, augmented, and then we rolled it up into industry and started to look at the impact per industry, but also per market and all of that. So all of that to say that some of the outcome are that financial services is definitely, you know, in, in the most impacted area. Um, uh, with a couple of other industry like software providers and things like that. So we can see financial services being, uh, I think the number of working hours potentially impacted by AI is estimated to be around 70%. And in that 70%, there's a roughly, and in the global number is 73% and the French number is 69%. So there's not much difference. And it's roughly half, half, half automation and half um, augmentation. I think the good part of it is the automation, and we were speaking about that just in preparation for this, the, the automation element or the augmentation element um, are, are coming in areas where, you know, people have a lot of work already, um, you know, like for example, the clerks or the branch management, and AI is going to really help uh, you know, those people who are already overloaded, you know, simplify uh, their work. Obviously, it's quite a tricky uh, job to estimate the, 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 the real impact. And I would like to call out this 
acceleration. So obviously, augmenting productivity to be able to do your job is one thing, but people are starting to talk about this error 429, which is cognitive overload <laughs> of the human being. And you know, like we human will have limit, at, you know, even if tasks are simpler, ultimately the change of context or the volume of tasks to deal with will, will actually be complicated to deal with. So we'll have to see how those things are, are, are coming out. Uh, it's a complex matter, but I'm very optimistic in the sense that there is amazing, there's a lot of skill shortage already on the market. So, you know, in digital area, so there will be more. We can see an increase, for example, in responsible AI skill in terms of the job posting, 21 times more in tw than 2019 in 2023, yeah? So we have 20, 21 uh, times more uh, now job posting, which is kind of huge. And we see the same with data and AI and other jobs coming through. Thank you very much, Leticia. Actually, I could spend my day here, but I think we're already uh, out of time. So I just have to thank you very much for the panel. I think it uh, was a very comprehensive uh, approach about how we, let's say, we try to implement uh, holistically uh, this uh, responsible AI as a banker. So thank you very much, really. And uh, I have the pleasure now to hand over to uh, the next session. And Olivier Giroir is going to introduce the next session, which will be more focused on the what and the use cases that were implemented uh, concretely in the city. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, delighted to be here with you today to talk uh, a little bit more about our generative AI journey in, uh, in Societe Generale. Um, we call this session Reality Check, and we are actually happy to share with you progress on some concrete uh, use cases we have in the bank. And I'll start with a quick introduction about um, our use cases and how we, uh, we have mapped the, the territory. So um, we divided the generative AI use cases into four main families. The first one is the one about content intelligence. As a bank, we have a huge amount of information. And here, the, um, the, the, the goal is to help our employees um, be, be augmented in a way, be better at what they do through generative AI. So how do we use, how do we make it the max of what we have as knowledge in the organization. I mean, it's, a, it's quite a daunting task. The second part is about um, content generation. So here it's about generating new contents to help with marketing, for instance, create new contents for press, for clients, for internal, um, also for maybe alerts or activity analysis providing some uh, summaries of what happens in the bank based on figures. The third category is about customer engagement. We think this is huge as well. Um, here we have a field to explore, to, give, to provide better service to our clients, um, to give the best of what we can to, to our client base. We can think obviously about chatbots and improved chatbots, much better and more intelligent chatbots. But also, how do we process the incoming emails, claims, to make sure that we give the right level of attention, uh, the, the quickest answer to these, uh, to these inquiries, and make sure, again, we give the best service to our clients. And finally, uh, a very important part where generative AI has an impact as well is for coding. So helping our developers, our population of developers, make the most of what generative AI can bring so that they can be more efficient, concentrate on the value-added tasks, maybe help with migration of code from older languages to more modern, like Python and these kind of things. The question now is, how do we go through this journey? Because that's quite the challenge. So starting from a pilot, from an ID, going to a proof of concept is actually the easy part. But how do we bridge the gap to this 
um, of these projects to reach, to scale up, to reach thousands of users through the organizations. And today we want to have two examples, two concrete examples of use cases in the organization that we have. So one is about retail banking. Um, and Martina will, uh, will join me on the stage to talk more about this use case. And one is about wholesale banking and customer engagement and see how we can manage those 20 million emails we get every year from clients and make sure we um, process them in the best way, in a timely manner. So we'd like to uh, welcome on stage Martina Maché. Um, Martina has started her career as a particle physicist with a PhD, and then she decided to move on, luckily for us, to the private sector and to uh, as a data scientist, and then head the uh, or co-head sorry the data lab in uh, in the retail banking. Martina, floor is yours. Hello, thank you very much for the invitation. So uh, yes, in, um, uh, at French Retail Banking, uh, we started working in, on generative AI quite uh, early, uh, about uh, one year ago. Um, and we decided to, uh, to do a first use case, uh, which is in the category of the content intelligence, uh, because I think that this is one of the category where generative AI can really uh, be a, a game changer. Uh, especially in the big companies where you have uh, a lot of information stocked everywhere and it's very difficult to access to this information and uh, to extract some value uh, from, uh, from it. So our um, project context is, uh, is the following. Uh, today in the retail bank uh, uh, we use a, a search engine um, to help uh, our collaborators uh, to find information uh, within the bank's uh, reference uh, document database. Um, this uh, search engine uh, is used uh, by most of our collaborators several times uh, per week and even several times per day uh, for, uh, for some people. And uh, the reference document uh, database, uh, um, it's a database with uh, very several typologies of, uh, of documents. Uh, we, we can have uh, uh, procedures, uh, uh, spreadsheets, uh, uh, some um, some uh, product uh, spreadsheets, and um, we can also have uh, a lot of uh, different formats uh, because uh, we can have PDF, Word, Excel. We can have screenshots, tabular data, uh, and finally, uh, this uh, that, um, this document uh, database. Uh, it's also very uh, voluminous. Uh, because uh, it can contain uh, several thousands of documents. And so we have uh, really several thousands of uh, consultation uh, each day. Uh, so today, the, the pain point that uh, we encounter is that um, the search engine that we use, uh, it works uh, with uh, keywords. So generally, collaborators, uh, they put uh, one, two, or three keywords. And you have to imagine that uh, uh, they have, uh, as, as an output, uh, a long list uh, of documents, and, they, and uh, it's very time consuming to find uh, in, within this list uh, the document you're looking for. Uh, and once uh, you found uh, the document, uh, it's very time consuming to find the information inside uh, this document. So, for example, if you're looking for a specific paragraph. Um, and so today, uh, collaborators uh, sometimes do not even find the information they are looking for. Uh, despite uh, the time invested uh, in, their, in their research. Um, and so in order to uh, address these pain points uh, and to uh, facilitate uh, the daily work of our collaborators, uh, we, um, uh, we, we developed uh, LACI, which is uh, an intelligent uh, assistant powered by generative AI. Um, so this uh, smart uh, assistant uh, work with a combination of um, document retrieval and uh, generation uh, and text uh, generation based uh, on generative AI in order to provide uh, to the user a contextualized and precise uh, answer uh, to, to the prompts uh, of, the, of the user. Uh, so 
how the solution, uh, it, how work the, the, the solution uh, in few words. Uh, basically, the, the user uh, writes his query uh, with a langu natural language. So uh, he really writes a, a sentence uh, with some context. And uh, LACI uh, uses the retrieval augmented generation in order to um, make some uh, text search uh, inside the, the document uh, database and to uh, retrieve uh, the important parts of the document and then use these important parts of the document uh, in order to generate uh, a contextualized uh, and precise answer and, um, and also in order to, um, um, to display uh, the parts of the document that have been used uh, for, uh, for the, the, the answer generation. And um, this project is um, quite important uh, from the business point of view uh, because uh, it can allow us to uh, address uh, to, and to contribute uh, to the three pillars uh, of the retail bank uh, business strategy. So we can uh, free up time for our collaborators in order they can focus uh, on uh, um, more um, value-added uh, tasks. Uh, we can improve also operational efficiency. Um, and finally, uh, we, are, uh, we can improve uh, also our uh, collaborators and customers' um, satisfaction. Because clearly, if uh, collaborators can uh, uh, find the information uh, uh, more easily and quicker, uh, they can also answer in a quicker way uh, to, our, uh, to our customer. So I, um, I just wanted to, uh, to show you a, a little uh, demonstration uh, of our solution. Um, I think that uh, with a little demonstration, we can catch uh, easier the, the value uh, of it. I'm sorry it's in French, but uh, I will comment it on the top. I think we just have to wait. Yes. <clears throat> SGRF uh, is the re French retail bank. So basically, you have a, a very simple interface uh, with a search uh, bar, like the, the one that you can see there. Atlas is the name of our reference database. And you can, uh, you can write your question inside uh, the search bar. Here, for example, uh, it's a question about uh, uh, a savings product for young people. And you have the, the answer just uh, uh, below, uh, as the one that you can see there. And below, you have the different documents that have been used uh, to generate uh, the answer. You have uh, five documents, and uh, you can go through them in order to, uh, to, to read them. And uh, on, on the top right, you can also open the document if you want to, to read uh, the, entire, uh, the entire document. So here you have uh, another little example about uh, how to diffuse some messages uh, in the screen uh, presenting the branches. So again, uh, you have a contextualized answer um, with below the different uh, sources. And uh, one important thing is also that uh, uh, inside the, I mean, we highlighted in, uh, in yellow really the paragraph that are very important and that have been used to generate uh, the, the answer. So you can really find the information uh, very quickly. Uh, and finally, what you can, uh, you can do uh, is to give us uh, uh, your feedback, uh, if you are OK or not with, uh, with the answer of the solution. And we will use this feedback in order to continuously improve uh, uh, our solution. So um, maybe just a few words about um, uh, some important things and some important lessons that we learned from, uh, from this uh, project. Uh, I wanted to share two things. The, the first one uh, is um, the importance uh, of, uh, and the difficulty also uh, of the evaluation, uh, of the performance evaluation of these models. 
because uh, you saw in the in the demonstration um, a, a very complete uh, and detailed um, answer. So you can have uh, this kind of answer, but you can also have uh, a shorter and incomplete answer, and maybe an incomplete answer for some uh, final users can be uh, a good answer, and for some other users uh, can be uh, a bad answer, not exhaustive in any case. Then you can have also the case uh, where um, our solution can uh, answer to you, I don't have enough con context in order to, uh, to give an answer. Um, so clear in this case, uh, the collaborator is not satisfied, but uh, I mean, I, I don't give uh, a false answer. And finally, you can have uh, hallucination, and there it's more risky because uh, you can give any, uh, any current information to, to your collaborators. And so basically, uh, depending on your use case, uh, it's quite difficult to put uh, the, the threshold in order to define uh, what is the correct uh, answer with respect uh, to a bad one. Um, and the second thing that I wanted to, uh, to share with you, which is quite linked with the, with the first one, is the importance uh, of the change management, uh, which is something which is always important uh, for, for every AI uh, project. But I think that with generative AI, we are even going further um, because uh, people are used to, um, to interact uh, with the machine uh, with keywords, with chatbot and with search engine. And now with generative AI, they have to learn to interact with the machine as if they had uh, a, a real person in front of them. And this is quite difficult. Uh, and, and generally what uh, final users do is uh, put some keywords uh, and uh, expect uh, to have uh, a very contextualized uh, answer. And it's not the case. Um, so we really have to, to teach them how to use uh, our solution uh, in order to, to use it in, in a proper way. And it's for this reason that um, we, we have had a, a, a test and learn approach that you can see on, on this final uh, slide. Basically, we started uh, in 2023 with uh, a first uh, POC uh, experiment. And the idea was really to, um, uh, to prove the value of this solution and also to test uh, different uh, technologies in order to see if we were able to do something with generative AI. Um, and uh, this POC was done uh, on a local environment just by the development, just by um, the retail data team and, uh, and the knowledge management team. And uh, once we proved the value, uh, we could uh, join the, the group uh, uh, wide uh, generative uh, AI platform, uh, which was just uh, deployed, so the timing was, uh, was really perfect. And um, thanks to this platform, uh, we can start uh, to scale up. Uh, so now we are in production in an MVP phase, and we are finishing some beta testing uh, with a few tens uh, of users. And we will use the feedback uh, of, uh, of this beta test um, in order to uh, continuously improve our solution uh, and have a first industrialization in June, uh, scaling up to a few hundred, uh, up to, we hope, a few thousands uh, users. Um, and finally, if this uh, big pilot uh, will be uh, satisfying, uh, we will scale up uh, on all the other users of the bank uh, up to uh, more than 20,000 uh, users. And uh, I would say that this second part uh, of the project was quite interesting because uh, we could work uh, in the group environment uh, and so working also with the other data labs, with the group IT, with the local IT, with the innovation, the group innovation department. And um, we really work uh, uh, with the other data lab in order to build uh, some uh, generative AI common assets uh, in order that they can be used uh, for the future use cases and uh, really makes uh, a lot of reuse instead of uh, every time uh, starting from, uh, from scratch. One question, Martina. 
Uh, we've seen great things from um, generative AI models like OpenAI, Gemini, Cloud. What's your experience in making this a reality for your business? Is it something easy or do, would you consider this is something actually complex and difficult? To use these models? To implement a project in real life in those, uh, in those conditions. Uh, I mean, um, yeah, I would say that it's, this kind of project is quite similar uh, to, to the AI project that uh, we were used uh, to. But it's true that, uh, I mean, the dimension, uh, I think it's, it's bigger, uh, really because, uh, I mean, the technology is very, um, I mean, they are almost uh, black boxes, let's say. Mm. And, um, uh, and so we really have to test uh, a lot uh, and to see how each model uh, respond. And um, what is interesting is, um, is also that, um, I mean, uh, we are facing some uh, technologies uh, which uh, evolved very, very quickly. Mm. And so it's, I mean, it's very difficult because uh, one day you can test uh, a model and uh, one week later, this model is already, let's say, has been. And uh, there are <laughs> 10 other models uh, <laughs> to, to test. Oh, so we, we always have the impression uh, to be on late, let's say. Um, and this is quite difficult because at a certain point uh, we also have to well to decide uh, okay uh, we choose this model uh, we uh, we put in production with this model and for the moment uh, we don't change. I think uh, this is quite difficult with respect to uh, to the classical uh, AI project. Thank you, Martina. Thank you. Um, I will welcome on stage now our second team with. Uh, we have Guillaume, uh, Guillaume Fournier, heading the, the data lab for the wholesale banking uh, part of the Société Générale. And uh, Daniel Herbera, who is leading the digital transformation of market operations. And uh, together, they lead the effort in uh, Gemini implementation in, uh, in wholesale banking. So, Daniel, Guillaume, floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> so. When we started our journey regarding generative AI, every single use case that was presented to us shared the same characteristics. They were incredibly complex and incredibly ambitious. And that's how generative AI is usually perceived, a kind of magician that can fix almost anything. So we decided to start with something that seems more achievable, managing incoming emails from our customer. At a high level, the process is quite straightforward. We receive the email, making sure it is sent to the proper team with a proper level of prioritization. We process them in our system, and we write an answer. And it seems to be a perfect fit for LLMs, text-to-text um, -text transformation, a lot of unstructured data, and the business value is obvious. We decided to start with the simplest use case we could imagine. We are going to develop a small copilot who will help our operators rewrite their email and make them more polite, more formal, more constructive. So, super simple. We were hyper confident it could be in production within two hours. But after running a few tests, we ended up with results like this one, where the initial intent of the operator has been totally transformed. So, that is a disaster. For this one, it's super easy to spot because the initial email is uh, super simple, but on more complex conversation, conversation, it can be more tricky. And this is not hallucination. In fact, we use a lot of very technical terms, but we also use a lot of common words that have a different meaning in our context. And the LLM cannot guess. So we were far from reaching our objective to get a pristine email but with the initial intent untouched. So we learned that there are three ways of prompting, three uh, levels of prompting. The basic one, please make that email more polite and please do not change its meaning. This is how you discuss at home with ChatGPT. And it's fine, it works. Most of the time it works, but most of the time that's not acceptable. Then you have the specialized prompt, 
where you give a lot of instructions, you give a lot of context. And it worked, but our prompt was so specialized that it was working for only one team. So it became basically useless. We learned how to prompt better. We were able to craft a prompt that was achieving its target, that was super effective, much simpler, uh, super efficient, but more importantly, that was scalable. So it could work for any team within the bank. So from this super simple use case, there are some key learnings that apply to every single use case we had to deal with within the investment bank. First, we are able to achieve incredible results super fast, sometimes up to 80% of the results in a matter of minutes. So this is awesome. This is super impressive. And that feels the super high expectations we all have regarding LLMs. But LLMs are not a magic wand. So they cannot grasp all the complexity of your process. They cannot have all the expertise. And in fact, we consider that LLMs should be seen as new joiners. So they are super smart. They know a lot of things. But this is their first day in the office. And they know nothing about your company. So every task that is assigned to them should be crystal clear. And the real deal, the real challenge with Gen AI is to achieve those remaining 20% and to control the final output. So th thank you, Daniel. So when we started our um, journey with Gen AI, we just not uh, try to build some uh, prototypes, but to build real applications that will serve our businesses and also to gain knowledge on the LLM. So we apply quite the same uh, receipt for all the projects. We first started to create a set of prompts. Then uh, we launched that prompts on documents or other pieces of context. And then we were hoping for good results and having, having those 80% uh, 80, uh, 80, 80 of uh, good results. Um, after a few tries, uh, we saw that some part, some part of the prompts uh, have patterns. I give you two examples. First one uh, is about the, our context, so the banking context, the banking jargon that we use. We put them in every prompt, and we can reuse that pieces for several use cases. The, my second example is about uh, technical instructions that you put in the prompt, for example, to control the output. Again, this can be reused on several use cases. Um, this led me to one remark about prompt engineering. We often discuss about it, and we, we, um, it's, it's uh, said that uh, prompt engineering is a new skill to, to master. And again, it will depend. For example, if you use a Gen AI algorithm as a personal assistant, uh, like when you use a chat GPT, then yes, here you should master prompt artifacts to, uh, to make the algorithm work uh, the, the, the way you want. But in our case, we are building assistants, leveraging on Gen AI, and most part of the prompts are streamlined directly in the assistant. And for the end user, it's simple. There is no new skill to master. It's just have to input the, the query. So after a few iterations, we had two main findings. First one is a quite obvious and was uh, expected is that we still need a lot of extensive testing because we want to control the output, we want to be sure of what the algo is doing. And even if the Gen AI has this very interesting characteristic of being a zero shot learning algorithm, we still need to have extensive label data to conduct proper testing. And that's the hard part of uh, most of the projects uh, now. Uh, our second findings um, is about the prompt themselves. And now we are really convinced that the prompts can be composed of uh, building blocks that are interchangeable and assembled on, uh, on uh, one uh, differently from one use case to another. Uh, a last remark on, uh, on this part um, is about the data science field. So we already are doing uh, AI projects, uh, and by meaning non-gen AI projects, and we already know how to validate projects. And yes, there is this new algorithm. It's a, it's a black box. 
but we already have tried and true uh, processes to validate those algorithms. And here we don't have to, to reinvent uh, the wheel. So we were making progress, but at the same time, we were increasingly frustrated because we knew we were about to hit a glass, a glass ceiling. We were not extracting all the potential we could see from uh, LLMs. So we moved to another approach by using AI agents. AI agents are independent AI entities that can collaborate and try to fix an issue. They are defined by a model, GPT, Llama, Mistral, you name it. Obviously, a prompt gives them goals and instructions. They can have skills or tools. So for example, they can call an API. They are no longer stuck in their bubble. They can access long-term memory. Um, so they can access to previous experience to see how the task was done before and benefit from it. But more importantly, they can discuss together, they can collaborate, they can correct each other, and that strongly improves the quality of the output. So here is a super simplified workflow on how we could better manage our emails. So an email is in the team's mailbox, and two agents have already started to work. One will do some sentiment analysis to help the operators prioritize better. Another one will do some complex intent detection, but not just to label the email, but to identify the team of AI agents that will be able to work on the topic raised by the customer and try to fix it. The email is going to enter a kind of chat room. There is a chat room manager, an AI chat room manager, who will organize the work. And they, there will be a few AI agent experts. Some can be experts in a domain, like, for example, collateral management. Some can be experts in a process, like, for example, payments. Some will share the same expertise, but will rely on a different model. Uh, it's like they have a different point of view on, on the same issue. They will think differently about it, and this will strongly enrich their conversation. When the job's done, they hand over to a controller, an AI controller, who will do some quality check, and hand over to an operator who will still have the final word. So AI agents, it is still not a magic wand. But what we see is that it uh, enables us to tackle much more complex issues than what we were able to do a few months ago. So to conclude this talk, um, we have uh, three obsessions when we built our use cases at every single step of the project. First one is about security. Um, we don't want to compromise on quality and accuracy of the data we serve to our clients. So testing is really, really a matter. And we don't want to ship um, products uh, with this kind of AIs too early uh, before having conducted an extensive te testing. Secondly, on the value part, so our use case, we are chosen um, to give value for, uh, for the bank and to be also deliver in a short uh, time frame, uh, so that we uh, really uh, deliver new value uh, for the bank. And the last point is about scalability. We had a lot of use cases, and we want that um, our product, we build our product, our tools, so that we can adapt and uh, progressively uh, release all that uh, use case base. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Daniel and, uh, and Guillaume, for sharing your, your experience with that. Um, as you have uh, seen through these examples, we have adopted a very structured approach to generative AI in Société Générale with uh, only uh, a few, uh, few precursor use cases targeting high value, where we build common foundations for generative AI through the bank. Um, we are learning to manage our risks and the, the specific risks of generative AI. And we're working through this journey together um, as a bank and as a group to, make, to scale up in the coming months and years. I will now hand over to, uh, to Etienne to, to talk about uh, how we accelerate in our AI journey um, in Société Générale. Welcome, Etienne. Thank you, Olivier. 
Hi everyone, I'm very happy to be uh, here with you today. So uh, as you noticed, on the first part of uh, this uh, workshop, we show uh, our vision uh, of AI as a bank and also uh, how we help our clients uh, which leverage with AI. On the second part, we, we show uh, uh, two uh, use cases uh, based on uh, generative AI. And now, on this third and last part of our workshop, we will uh, try to see how we can accelerate to use AI. So uh, this last part would be split in, uh, in two uh, subparts, actually. Uh, first, with, we have the pleasure, we, we have the chance to have uh, today uh, Alexandra Moussavisadeh, who is the co-founder and CEO of Evident Insights. For those who don't know, actually Evident Insights produce a benchmark on the AI maturity of banks and financial institutions. And the particularity of this benchmark is it is based on public data with more than 100 of uh, data points. So it is very interesting. So Alexandra, on the first part, will present her work uh, on the benchmark and, and also some great insights about the bank's maturity. And on the second half of this part, we will have a round table on how we can uh, accelerate going, going faster, uh, going deeper with AI. So please welcome Alexandra Moussafisadeh. <laughs> Thank you, Etienne. Um, I might sit down. Uh, Thank you, Etienne. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I am, as Etienne said, I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of Evident. We are actually the first uh, to ever benchmark banks on their AI maturity publicly. So what we do is um, we produce this index. Some of you might have seen it. We, uh, are, we rank uh, banks publicly on their AI maturity. As Etienne said, this is based on outside-in assessment. Uh, we gather millions of data points uh, on all of the activities of uh, AI in the banking sector. And we funnel these, uh, data, this data into 100 plus, it's about 115 indicators per bank that then uh, go into these four pillars that make up the uh, way that we define the AI ecosystems of banks. And they, they go into talent, uh, innovation, leadership, and the transparency of responsible AI. Um, we look at uh, talent in, uh, I'm going to go into that in a bit more detail in a minute, but what we look at is the entire talent stack of a bank. What AI capabilities does a bank have when it comes to its talent? And we all know there's a war on talent going on, so it's quite a difficult one to, to, um, to tackle. Um, we know from the leading banks, it's something that they've focused on for a very long time. Uh, innovation, we look at the various levers that the banks can pull for their AI uh, innovation strategy. Uh, we look at research, we look at patents, we look at what banks are investing in, who they're partnering with, and we look at activity on open source. And then we look at leadership, which is all about how is a bank positioning externally their AI strategy. It's a very important uh, aspect of AI uh, talent acquisition, but also for communications with shareholders and clients, et cetera. And then we look at the transparency of uh, responsible AI, uh, which is obviously something that the banks, and we know that also, um, in this case, is, is heavily regulated, so a lot is happening behind the scenes. But what we're looking at here is what is over and above being stated by the bank. So if we double-click on all of this, um, this is probably a bit too small for you to read, but just um, so you have a sense of how we measure and how we benchmark banks on their AI uh, maturity. Talent weighs the most, 45% of the index is on talent. Um, it is obviously an incredibly important part of the engine room, 
Uh, it's also an expression of the AI strategy of the bank. We split it into two, so it's an AI talent uh, stack. So we look at 240 role titles that are AI related in the bank. Um, we look at AI development capability, we look at model risk, we look at the implementation of AI, um, and then we also look at the training and career development. So one thing is to uh, acquire AI talent, uh, just as important it is to retain AI talent. Um, on the innovation side, it weighs 30%, so the majority of the index is leaning on the talent capacity and also the innovation strength. And here we look at all of these levers that the banks are pulling, as I mentioned before. Um, and everything is AI focused. So the AI, pure and ap applied research, AI focused talents, investments into AI companies um, that drive the acceleration of AI implementation, partnerships with universities, incredibly important funnels for AI, um, AI talent. And then on the leadership uh, side, this is uh, not only what the bank is saying in terms of this is how much we're investing in, these are the number of use cases we have in the pipeline and in production, um, this is the ROI on our AI, but also looking at the group leadership level um, and looking at the composition of the executive team uh, and looking at who sits on the executive team because at this stage, and as we've just heard about before, it's all about reacting quickly to what is on the front end of AI innovation. So getting this time to production down as quickly as possible is very much linked to how the bank is organized to make those decisions around what is needed from an infrastructure uh, perspective, what is needed when it comes to making decisions on which provider to go with, uh, all of that and you know, it determines how quickly you can move from ideation to production. And that's why we have that in the leadership pillar. Um, just uh, last but not least, I wanted to mention that we're also be going to be rolling out in the next couple of weeks an outcomes benchmark. And this is measuring the banks uh, in a private benchmark, looking at all of these use cases in production. Uh, what is the associated ROI, which everyone was talking about before. Um, looking at what is the complexity of the use case, uh, what is the impact over time, and what are all of the enabling factors that go in to solve and, uh, from getting an, a, a use case from ideation to production. And so we're going to be uh, rolling this out to all the banks uh, in the index and beyond, uh, and looking at this in detail where the use cases are sitting, uh, where in the bank they're sitting, and which, of, which one of these use cases have the most impact. And so if, um, you know, what does this all mean? What's the link to the bottom line? Uh, we are just starting to track this. Uh, we get this question often. It's like, how is it impacting the bank's bottom line? Can we start to see it yet? And when you look at, um, this is very quickly done at the back of the envelope, but if you start looking at the performance of the top five banks in our index, which are, um, JP Morgan, Capital One, RBC, and so on. And looking at their stock performance uh, uh, over the last 12 months, there's absolutely no doubt, um, these banks are very different, that this is starting to have a positive correlation. Over time, we think the correlation is going to be even stronger uh, between the, uh, where you sit on, the, on your AI maturity versus your, versus your stock price over time. But this is just to give you a quick indication of where the banks are performing uh, when it looks at where they're sitting on the index and versus their stock price. If you double click on the, uh, on the index itself, it's really interesting to see the wide range of performance. And looking at JP Morgan is number one, but JP Morgan in terms of its scores is just way outperforming everyone else. Followed by Capital One, then uh, Royal Bank of Canada. JP Morgan has been uh, focused on and investing in AI for a very, very long time. Most banks have been, but um, they spend a lot. Uh, they have rolled it out across uh, all of the bank at a group level. And uh, you can really start to see that that capability and the ability to attract talent and all of the things that you need to be able to implement and put AI into production, all of these aspects that JP Morgan is, is by far leading in. We're starting to see a bifurcation in the performance of the index here. 
um, that is that the banks that are leading are leading by more since our first iteration of the index back in January over the last year. We see that the leaders are pulling ahead and that those are not putting anything into, you know, uh, investing in or focusing on uh, are really starting to fall behind. So in the US, you're starting to see this bifurcation in the banks. So you're seeing that in Europe as well. You're seeing it in the UK. Um, that the leaders are leading more, and those are not, the, the laggards are are really starting to fall behind, which is really worrisome because this is only going to accelerate. Um, I just took a snapshot here at SockGen's performance. Uh, we're going to dive into that when we bring our speakers and panelists onto stage. But just to show you where where uh, some of the results here for SockGen specifically. Uh, ranks really well uh, in uh, you know in the European context overall. Uh, ranks 20th. Um, you have uh, Sokgen performing here very highly on talent, up uh, at a ninth position, so sitting in the top 10. Um, slightly lower on innovation, which is not um, unusual for a lot of the European banks not following uh, a patent strategy, not uh, diving into. Uh, having a research lab and so on. On leadership, very strong. Uh, on transparency uh, of responsible AI in 2021 position. One uh, area of particular strength where SockGen outperforms uh, all the banks in the index here is on talent development and literally ticks every single box that we look at when it comes in uh, to the question of talent development. We look at, um, this is a part of the talent pillar. Uh, where we look at what is a bank doing to really focus on retaining and also attracting talent. What are you doing with the AI tra talent that uh, you have in the bank already? And having this very publicly facing, you are also uh, making a big statement around uh, what you're doing with your AI talent and it's very good for talent attraction. But here above, uh, JP Morgan, uh, uh, SockGen is performing well in terms of both having an IC track but also showing that the training in AI for its uh, for the bank's senior leadership, uh, also training specifically for AI development roles, uh, looking at uh, having a centralized uh, data and AI training for the bank, something that JP Morgan doesn't have, and also evidence that the company is providing training to all of its AI, uh, uh, in AI to all of its employees, um, and provides training in digital skills uh, to all of its employees too. This is something that uh, no other bank does. I just thought I would highlight that as an example of SockGen's performance. Um, we have some fresh data out. Uh, two more minutes. Yeah, I'll just do a couple more. Uh, this is fresh data. We, uh, we mine our data in real time. Um, so we pull the data on who's hiring for what in terms of AI across all the banks, who's poaching, uh, where, where are banks hiring from, uh, what are the recent research papers, what are the announcements of use cases. So we track all of this in real time, but I'm just going to pull out a couple of slides uh, from what we have found of the fresh cut of the talent data that we released last week. And here you can see that the um, increase of AI talent across all the banks is just around 10%. Even with banks that are cutting employees, they're not cutting their AI talent, they're doubling down. So, um, so that's, that's quite robust. What we see is that the dominant area of growth in AI talent is happening in the implementation side. This is looking at, you know, this is evidence of AI use cases moving from testing and really into production and looking at banks hiring the talent that is needed to put AI into production. That is uh, also very dominated by the US banks, just to say, not so much in the European banks. But that is one of the key takeaways from what we've seen in the, in the AI, on the AI talent data that, um, that we've just collected. So European banks are paying, playing catch up a bit. You've got the UK coming from a very low base, but increasing their AI talent by 12%, and then the core European or continental European by 10%. Um, the U.S. starts with a lot higher base in their AI talent um, and have increased that uh, just over the last uh, handful of months by 10%. Um, and then uh, in terms of the talent capability, uh, that uh, ranking is unchanged uh, since the November index. 
um, but still that those are the that in, in the leader also the ones that are growing in their in their in their hiring of, of talent and you see stock gen here is is uh, among the banks that are really leading in the AI talent stack so that's very interesting led by JP Morgan uh, followed by Wells Fargo and Capital One and then Bank of America for those who can't see um, and that remains unchanged um, just a quick snapshot of research. Um, this is something that more and more banks were seeing, uh, pushing ahead, establishing research labs and centers of excellence. JP Morgan, again, uh, really far ahead on his AI research. They've established a research lab under the Manuela Veloso, uh, but they keep pulling ahead. This is very much uh, you know, followed by RBC, TD Bank in, in Canada, Capital One. And so you start to see Wells Fargo has made some changes in his AI strategy. You can start to see that coming through in the AI research where they're eclipsing all the others and moving ahead. Um, they're doubling down on their AI staff, on AI research, uh, AI implementation. They're moving from a central to a you know, centralized organizational structure, and but putting a lot of that research and capabilities in the federated lines of business. But we can talk more about that. Um, just uh, quickly, one on patents is a very much of a, a lever that the US banks use. So not dwelling too much on this, but just so you can see that you've got Capital One and Bank of America very much in the lead, and not so much something that the European banks spend time on. Um, I will, um, I will stop here. Uh, we're going to be diving into the uh, details of all of these results and what it means to, uh, you know, set in place an AI strategy to actually execute it, uh, and what it takes in the context of SOCGEN. So I'm going to invite uh, all the panelists up again to um, take seats and uh, talk about SOCGEN's AI strategy in particular. So Etienne, Martin, and Guillaume. Thank you very much for, for joining me here on, uh, um, on the panel. Thank you so much for, I don't know if we wanted to give them a round of applause to welcome them to, um, to this conversation. Thank you. Anyway, I gave you a, a whistle-stop tour here of uh, this uh, uh, index that tracks AI maturity, looking at the the North American banks looking at the European banks, and now we have the chance to dive in and be a bit more specific about what's going on at uh, SOCGEN. And uh, the first question uh, from our index, uh, we have, um, if you drill down into the results, um, SOCGEN performs incredibly well on the AI narrative, which sits within the leadership pillar. And that AI narrative, you sit number six, and uh, my question to you all, uh, maybe I start with you, Etienne, is uh, what does that, if you could talk to us a bit about that, the, you know, the AI strategy of the bank and the AI transformation. Um, you are actually one of the very few banks in the index that talks specifically about the uh, amount spent by the bank, the AI strategy itself. You talk about the use cases in quite a lot of detail and much more that, uh, than other banks do. You talk about, you're starting to talk about return on investment of, of your AI investment into the bank. And actually, um, back in January, I think there were only one or two banks that did that. And now there are only, still only about five or six that do that, and you're among those. So I wonder if you could talk to us about, you know, how you see it from your side. Okay. Thank you, Alexandra. Maybe I will be the guy who say, who say some obvious facts uh, about AI. So uh, first, uh, AI technology uh, is evolving at a fast pace. And, and guess what? Uh, it's getting faster and faster. And uh, I'm still surprised when we see day by day uh, announcement, astonish uh, uh, result from, from new models. Last, last week, OpenAI uh, presents the new model, uh, uh, GPT-4.0, which is quite impressive. So, so first obvious fact, it's getting very f fast. And, and the second one is uh, um, the regulation uh, is getting more, uh, now more precise, more mature. And uh, the question is, in this context, how we can deliver 
the maximum value uh, based on AI. So uh, I think it's clear for us to, to, to develop with some principles. And maybe I can share with you four main principles we have. The first one is to, to be able to, to develop uh, AI in a controlled way. Uh, I mean by that to, to respect some common, uh, common uh, at, uh, at um, a group, SG group level, some common rules uh, on the, uh, how to assess the, the, the AI and the risk uh, on AI uh, in line with the regulation. And as you know, maybe, uh, I'm, sh I'm sure you know, on, on this Tuesday, uh, the a European AI Act has been finally validated and now it will be uh, uh, published in, in, the, in the couple of, of days. And it's, for, for me, this, in this context, the regulation is, is, is also an opportunity to think about our process, how we assess the risks. And can we, and, and, and by the way, the European regulation has a risk-based approach, which is quite relevant, and maybe we can do things simpler do things faster uh, in, the, the, with the, in the light of the regulation. So this is the first principle, develop in a controlled way. The second principle is to be very uh, focused on the business value. And by that, to, to use AI uh, to serve uh, the, the business. Uh, and, and, uh, and for how we do that, we need to involve our senior executive to be able to identify in a global portfolio what is the best uh, use cases and, uh, and to steer uh, this. The, our third principle is, uh, it, maybe to, you know the, the context of Société Générale, but we, we have a cost efficiency imperative. And in this context, it's very important uh, from a technical perspective to think um, uh, with platform. And by platform, I mean to be able uh, to uh, work together, to have common foundation, and to develop once, and, 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 and to use that. And our fourth principle is about um, the change. Uh, is about involve all our employees to handle uh, the um, um, uh, what, what induced the, the AI, what are also the limitations. And for example, we are currently working with HR to, uh, to see uh, what is the impact on these new technologies on the workforce. And it's quite a, a, a complex topic. Thank you, Etienne. The war on talent, which keeps coming back again and again. Um, I'd like to hand over to Martina and talk to us from, a, from your view on, on this from the retail side of the bank? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, at French uh, retail banking, uh, I would say that uh, our first priority uh, is to, um, to deliver AI solutions um, that are aligned with the, with the strategy, uh, with the business strategy of, uh, of the retail bank. Um, because finally, we want to, to deliver something which is useful for our collaborators and not just uh, put in production models that will never be used uh, uh, by, uh, by our collaborators. And uh, it's for this reason that uh, we always work uh, in a test and learn uh, approach. Uh, as I was saying also before for generative AI, uh, generally we start uh, with the first um, version of our solution and uh, we test it uh, with the final users uh, we collect their feedback in order to continuously improve uh, our solution. And we will go in production just when we are satisfied uh, with, uh, with our performances. Um, and uh, coupled to this, uh, it's very important also uh, the change management uh, with our collaborators in order they can uh, really use uh, our solutions uh, in, the best, uh, in the best way. Um, and secondly, uh, we are also very focused uh, on the uh, innovation and the R&D um, uh, approach. Uh, 
because uh, we try to test new technologies, uh, to try uh, innovative use cases in order to be um, proactive with the business and uh, in order to uh, anticipate their future needs uh, and not just being uh, in, a, in a posture of uh, waiting uh, for, their, uh, for their input. Yes, and then when it's happening at such speed, it's hard to keep up, I can imagine. I'm just wondering, before we go over to Guillaume and talk about from a wholesale perspective, I wonder if you could share just maybe a quick thought on whether you have that uh, looking, looking out on the horizon and from an R&D perspective. Does that sit centrally in the bank or is it placed in the lines of business? That was for you, Martina. That's for me? Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, so I didn't no, no, no. I was, saying, I was saying from your perspective, when you're looking at the R&D and looking at the research and looking at the horizon uh, on sort of what's coming at you in terms of the capabilities of AI, does that sit in the lines of business? Does that sit solely at the retail side? Or do you find that some of that capability sits also in the central part of the bank? Or is it mainly developed in the retail arm, the R&D? Yeah. Uh, is it centrally organized or is it organized federally? Um, I mean, there are two things, uh, actually. Uh, we, are, we, we have uh, an R&D organized in our, uh, let's say, uh, retail uh, data science department. Um, so there we really try to, uh, to work uh, on the future use cases uh, for the retail bank. Uh, but we also work uh, in a more uh, global, let's say, environment at the group uh, level. And for example, for generative AI, um, we work uh, a lot with other data labs um, in order to build uh, common assets uh, for, uh, for generative AI. Uh, for example, in this moment, uh, we are working on um, an evaluation uh, framework uh, with uh, some other data labs, because the idea is that uh, for use cases which are uh, quite, um, let's say, global and generic uh, within the bank, it's important to have uh, some uh, common assets in order to, to do some uh, reuse and uh, in order not to, uh, to, to start uh, from scratch uh, every time. Yeah, yeah, that's the big debate around you don't want to centralize too much because it could be a bottleneck. On the other hand, also, if too much is in the lines of business, there's a risk of duplication. But anyway, I'd love to hand over to you, Guillaume, and get a, a perspective from the wholesale side of the bank. Yes, on, on the wholesale side, it's quite the same. In fact, we are really focused to first for the delivery. And when Etienne say, for example, that each week there are a lot of new models that are coming out, uh, but we don't spend time by testing and comparing them. Our first priority is to make the use case uh, happen for the users. And then afterwards, it, it, it it will be uh, some evolution, but that's really our focus. So maybe I can jump to the next uh, topic, which is the uh, AI t a on AI talent. Um, as you noticed, you do particularly well on AI development and training and skills, uh, uh, upgrades uh, across the bank. Um, and I wonder if maybe you could comment on, we've been, we've been touching upon in this, session and the session before, uh, that there is a war on talent. Talent is really difficult to get. Um, and the position the bank puts itself in to attract the talent is, is something I think all banks are thinking about right now. But from your perspective, to sort of um, grow the talent, uh, attract the talent to the bank, to make sure that the talent stays in the bank, what is, can, can you give us a, your thoughts on that and a perspective? Yes, on, on, uh, on the talent, uh, uh, previously in the prevention, there is also a big ecosystem uh, here in Paris uh, with a big competition, not only with the banks, but with startups, with core uh, AI tech companies. Um, but this is also uh, some opportunity uh, because the people are here. Um, more concretely, um, in our team, uh, we offer also research internships uh, for students in their masters so that they can come to us and then uh, afterward uh, stay, in the, stay in the team. Uh, we try also to be connected to the ecosystems. 
uh, we have also some people in our team that are uh, teaching in uh, in masters in uh, in some uh, universities and so that uh, that's a lot of effort to be uh, present uh, but if we do that effort we still manage to uh, hire people from the from the best master can I ask you a question on that? Um, there's a lot of anxiety in the UK about the um, really strong tech community and uh, that you're fostering in France. And a lot of talent is moving actually from the UK down to Paris. Um, I'm, I think the UK is trying to hold on to it, by the way, but they can't. I'm just wondering, with the growth of, you've got Hugging Face, you've got Mistral, you've got others that are emerging. You've got uh, a really what, what seems like a, a, a strong and strengthening ecosystem of talent and tech capabilities here. Do you feel that from your ability, you know, the amount of talent that's coming, that the ecosystem, do you see that uh, here also? Do you have more um, a growing talent pool in, in France? Is that something you sense? I don't know who wants to answer that, but... Guillaume, I don't know if you, this is something you see. Yes, we, we, uh, uh, if we look around, we see that there is all the, all the tech startup which is very growing. Um, we are a bit far from that, but uh, on my point, by going to meetups and so on, we all see that, uh, that community, which is very, very active. Yeah. yeah. Martina, I'm going to hand that same question over to you from um, how you are growing uh, the talent on your end, the bank, and, and, how, and how you see that attraction and fight for talent is, is uh, taking shape. Yeah, um, I, I quite agree with, uh, with Guillaume. Um, also in, at the retail uh, data lab, uh, we generally what we try to do, uh, it's a uh, focus on, uh, on trainings for our talent. Uh, and um, on, um, on recruiting the, the good profiles. So for, for trainings, clearly we have a team and individual trainings uh, in order to also to, um, to meet the needs uh, of our talents to develop their career. Because uh, I mean, every person can, uh, can think to a specific uh, path. And uh, so we try to adapt our training uh, uh, proposal uh, to, to, each, uh, to each collaborator. Um, and uh, concerning the, um, uh, the, the sourcing, uh, we try to, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, intervene uh, in, uh, at schools uh, quite uh, regularly uh, in order to present uh, our uh, work, our field, and, uh, and try to, uh, um, to, um, to source the, the, best, uh, the best profiles. Uh, via internships uh, and stage, uh, etc. And um, I would say that uh, an important thing is also, I mean, once the talents are uh, at Société Générale, is what uh, we can do in order to take them uh, with us. Um, and um, for this, uh, we, we created uh, a data science community uh, inside our, uh, our data lab. Um, where we make some uh, technologic uh, and uh, market uh, watch, uh, where we discussed uh, about uh, some uh, interesting uh, research articles, etc., that uh, that we can uh, we can read, and this brings also us to, uh, as I was saying before, to to test new technologies and uh, new approaches, um, in order to also motivate uh, our our collaborators, um, and uh, and finally I. I think that uh, in the retail bank, we also have a quite motivating environment because um, I see that our collaborators can uh, interact uh, with, um, uh, with many departments. Uh, we address uh, all the different typologies of customer in the retail uh, bank. So we, we discuss regularly with the business uh, department, but we also interact uh, with uh, all the other data labs. Um, and, uh, and we also interact a lot with the IT department. And so our collaborators can uh, improve uh, their art skills, but also their soft skills, uh, and especially their, um, their business and their strategic vision, uh, which is something quite important for talents in order to uh, maybe uh, switch to some uh, more uh, management and strategic uh, career. Yeah. And to you, Etienne, at a group level, what is your perspective? 
Okay, maybe what, what I can say, um, um, AI start by every one of us. I mean, uh, um, at group level, we, we are focused on uh, the AI appropriation, and we, we actively work on this topic for uh, five, five years, maybe more. So the idea is to make everyone uh, uh, able to, to handle uh, the impact of this technology. So, uh, for instance, uh, uh, this year, uh, we did a, a, a training for the SG board in March in order to, uh, to have a discussion on the state of the, uh, uh, the, the AI, the market. The AI. And we will do, um, later this year, we'll do the same with the executive committee, the CODIR, to have this discussion with, with them. Uh, we create we, um, some program, uh, uh, many hours, for our executive with the Harvard uh, uh, University to, uh, to make them uh, uh, aware of, of this uh, technology and how we can use it. Uh, and of course, for all the staff, we have some of a lot of uh, online trainings. Uh, and I think uh, in terms of metrics, we have uh, 5,000 uh, uh, certification uh, from this online uh, um, training. So um, yeah, it's AI appropriation, it's key uh, for, for, for the bank. Yeah, you're making everyone AI literate at the bank, which is uh, something that a lot of people are looking at to do the same. Um, I think if we would love to shift from the talent side, um, it's something actually we spend a lot of time on uh, talking to to the banks, and maybe we can get back to this in a minute, on sort of what is the most important thing for the AI talent when they're looking to join a company, you know, having, but training and development and that, having that very visible, knowing that the ecosystem is strong is something that we hear often from AI talent because they can go many places. But if we shift to the innovation side, um, and, our, and, you know, as you could see, we in, uh, in our benchmark look at a number of things in our innovation pillar research patents, investments, uh, acquisitions of AI companies, but we also look at open source. And here, uh, the, you know, you do particularly well on open source activity. And Guillaume, I'd love to hand this over to you in terms of how you see the AI innovation strategy, um, how that fits into the bank's innovation strategy, but also how, that, how you impact the AI ecosystem more broadly here. Yes, uh, about open source, uh, two things. The first one, we are, uh, like any other, big consumer because all the ecosystem is massively uh, open source uh, in terms also of models. Uh, today, nobody can, could work without uh, getting models from Hugging Fakes, for example. Um, but we also have some, uh, so it's some small initiative because it's not in the core of the, of the bank to build open source systems. But we have two examples. Uh, in my team, we open source an AutoML library, uh, which is used internally uh, to test. Uh, so here it's not on Genai, but on classical uh, machine learning models, so to test a lot of models. And uh, uh, another um, uh, library has been built with an insurance company uh, on uh, interpre interpretability of uh, AI systems. So we also try uh, sometimes to uh, build small pieces of uh, uh, and uh, get back to the community. Yes, and I, I'm going to hand over to you, Etienne, on that one too, because it also sits in very important at a group level. So the AI ecosystem is very uh, important for, for us. Uh, whether uh, on technological aspect, I mean technological partners, whether uh, on the academic world, and um, we are... Uh, uh, we participate to uh, some think tank uh, about, for instance, with, with the Up Francia, about que on question about AI risks. So uh, we produce uh, collectively some paper and that. And, and um, we are uh, working with some uh, academics like um, uh, Polytechnic or Sorbonne University. Uh, we, have, uh, we, are, um, uh, we have a partner, the, uh, the research a center of artifacts uh, on which we work. Uh, the question is, are we able to use some, in, innovate, some new model 
based on uh, trees and uh, random forest. But uh, this model are they sufficiently uh, explainable to be used at scale within the bank. So for us, uh, re research is important. To apply this research to the, the bank world is, 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 is very, very strategic. And I'm going to hand over to you in a minute, Martina, but it's interesting from our perspective when we observe the banks, we've got some banks who say, if you ever see any of our AI talent on, active on open source, tell us so we can remove them because they don't want to have that. And then we've got, and then in the index, tending, the banks that do very well overall are typically very active in the open source community. So we're starting to see that correlation. It's really interesting, actually. But I'd love to hear your perspective on this from the retail side. Yeah. Yeah, clearly, uh, I mean, uh, also the, the retail uh, side, we, uh, we, we work a lot with, uh, with open source. We, we, we use it uh, every day in our daily, daily work. And for example, for generative uh, AI, for our use case, uh, especially in the first part of our project, uh, we really tested a lot of uh, uh, open source uh, models uh, via GameFace, for example. So it's something which is a... Uh, really present in our, uh, in our work. Uh, and um, I think that uh, the important thing is also to, uh, to stay connected with the AI ecosystems in order to, uh, uh, to always uh, be, uh, let's say, on the edge of, uh, of innovation. Um, and for this, uh, for example, we intervene uh, quite uh, regularly, uh, presenting or just uh, for, uh, uh, to listen. Uh, in, uh, in the data community uh, events uh, in order to, uh, to share also our experience with our peers. Um, and an, impor an important thing that uh, we also do uh, at the retail bank is um, uh, the fact that uh, we, we follow a lot the startup ecosystem uh, because we try to uh, identify a startup uh, with which uh, it's very interesting to work with. Um, and uh, as is the case of, uh, of Nymer, so uh, we really try to identify startups that can uh, bring us uh, some uh, added value uh, to, our, to our strategy. Um, and finally, for our collaborators, uh, we also try to organize uh, uh, regularly uh, some learning uh, expeditions. Uh, for example, uh, for the API days, uh, for the uh, Big Data and AI forum, or also with, uh, within uh, startup incubators um, in order to uh, let's say, extract them from the day-by-day -day work and uh, to, to open their, uh, their mind uh, to, uh, to the innovation. Yes, thank you very much. Should we open up for Q&A now? Would that, yes? I think we, uh, we are running out. Oh, thank you very much. I think what we will do, if, I, if that's fine for you, that we will keep the question for we have a kind of a cocktail afterwards, so we have a, a broad range of panelists. So what we'll do is that we'll keep the question for the cocktail part. I just want to take a minute to really thank you all, all our panelists from all the workshop. I think it was a very comprehensive approach. Thank you very much, Alexandra, and thank you to all the speakers. And let's continue the discussion uh, at the cocktail. Thank you.